Jeff uh, to the recruitment brochure. That ended up getting posted on Monday. It's open for 30 days. Um, we did post that on um, on our website and then Ben sent out a, a couple of different constant contacts to different groups. So we communicated to over 75 people and we actually had about 50 people participate in providing feedback. And there was a common theme um, regardless of, of your position of, of where you're at. And so that was really exciting. So what to expect next is that um, for the next 30 days, um, applicants will apply. ADK will go through and, and screen them. Um, after that 30 days, we're going to have a panel. We'll have an internal panel um, and an external panel, and we'll be asking a member of the CNR, the airport advisory board, um, a number of different tenants at the airport will be a part of this panel for the external panel. Um, hopefully, we'll have about six candidates. I'm not exactly sure the number, just depending on who applies. Um, once that's narrowed down um, from those two panels, the top two candidates, we're going to schedule for an open forum, a community open forum, where anyone from the public has the opportunity to come and meet these two candidates and provide feedback. Um, I'm looking at creating a forum for people to provide feedback um, so that we can make the final selection. That time frame for an offer is expected to be at the beginning of May. Um, and so then um, this is a national recruitment. I currently don't know where people live, so um, it really depends on their obligations and their their ability to move here because that is a requirement. So we're looking at the earliest May, but honestly, probably June or July before we have the airport director vote. So just wanted to share that. Um, I also um, would like to just get in a pattern of talking about um, Jeffco business agendas for the airport. So Tuesday is when our board of county commissioners meet, and we do have two items on the agenda for Tuesday. Um, one of them is the Part 150 study, and that's where we're going to request permission for the money from the FAA to get approval to be able to uh, apply and receive the funds from the FAA um, for this noise study. And then just so you know, the recruitment process for that, we are not following the Jeffco procurement process. We have to follow the FAA's recruitment process, and that requires us posting a statement of qualifications. Um, and so we met with the FAA um, a couple weeks ago to get that down. So as soon as we get approval, that statement of qualifications will go out. We will find the most qualified vendor. Um, and then the next steps, um, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, are once we select the vendor with the most qualified, we do a statement of work, we get a cost estimate, we verify the cost estimate with independent vendors, and then we do a final contract and go under contracting, um, and then they would begin the work. So it's really important for us to go through this process um, by the fall. We think we can do it. We're urgently pushing the steps. This is a new process for us. It's different from what we do. Um, if for some reason we miss the FAA's budget window, it would push funding to April 25. I just wanted to share that we're not expecting that, but we are working towards this. We're already in March now. We have, we feel we're not going to have any problems getting this done uh, for that uh, fall timeline to get the funds. So that's that one. Can I just add something? Sure. So people are curious about what a 150 study looks like. I would encourage you to go on the Centennial Noise Roundtable and look at the minutes of their meetings. They are in the process of applying for their second part 150 study. So they've been doing this for years. They have reports every month around from their noise monitors around the community. So I would encourage if you're curious at all about this, spend a little time on the Centennial Noise Roundtable webpage. Thank you. Okay. And then, then I'm going to ask if you can give the uh, the taxiway O and D update. Sure. So we'll also be giving a briefing on Tuesday about a second grant uh, to complete the taxiway Otis and Delta construction. We already briefed a first grant and the overall project back in 2023, but we've since secured. At that time, we didn't have the full typical 95% uh, funding that we would get from a combination of the FAA and and CDOT Aeronautics. But we've since lined up a bipartisan infrastructure law airport infrastructure grant called Bill um, and a second grant from CDOT Aeronautics to cover and get us up to that full 95%. So that'll be that briefing. It's mainly about finances for the project. Thank you. And then the third item that we have is for um, all the appointments to our boards and commissions. 
Um, all of them were supposed to be um, presented on February 27th. It got delayed until till Tuesday. Um, so we did cancel our March airport advisory board meeting because we didn't have the new uh, members appointed. And so we'll reconvene that uh, in April um, once those ne uh, members are appointed on Tuesday. So the three main items we have for business. And then I also just want to share um, one of our main priorities that we're working on at the airport is the transition to unleaded fuel. So we did um, purchase a fuel truck. And right now we're in the process of procuring the fuel tanks. We have two options. We, we can either buy new. We also have um, someone on property that has an above ground fuel tank. And so we're looking at um, having those conversations, I think this week, right? Yeah. Brian, they're this coming week. this week yeah. um, to figure that out. So we are hoping to be um, in that purchasing process for that tank this month. So we're just figuring out if we're buying new or procuring an existing one. Um, and then we're working with our county attorney's office and then our FBOs about a process for what is this sale of fuel look like? And so we're starting those conversations to figure out what agreements we need to have in place. Once we get the, the fuel tank and the fuel farm all set up and get fuel in there, what does that arrangement look like for um, aircraft to, to have unleaded fuel? So we'll keep you um, up to speed on that, but it's definitely a priority that we're working on. Our entire board of county commissioners, airport team, County manager are all excited about uh, having this opportunity to make that transition quickly. Uh, so those are those are my updates. Great, thank you, uh, roundtable members. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, okay. uh, we will. I, guess I have one question. Oh, yes, of course. Um, um, on the purchase of the tanks for the unleaded fuel, is that going to be enough? tanks and enough supply to supply all of the aircraft with only unleaded or is it just going to be an option? It's going to be an option. We have to have leaded fuel until 2030. So um, that's that's a requirement. So 2030 is really when the unleaded transition is expected to happen. Um, so we will have to have that. What we are doing is making sure that we have unleaded fuel available. And all of our flight schools are 100% behind this transition. They're going to do it safely. Um, we're also going to help them um, give them some financial incentives to cover the cost of the certification um, to make sure that they have that ability to switch from leaded to unleaded. Okay. But I'll keep you up to speed each month as we know more. Thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to add, and I think those people that listened last night, you heard a lot of the pilots talk about that there's not unleaded. There's not a source of unleaded fuel that is sitting out there that people are just refusing to use. The industry is developing this fuel. There is talk in the industry, if you do some research, that um, there's a possibility that planes might not need to convert, but that it's pretty early on. So we are just preparing ahead of time. So buying a truck and buying a tank doesn't mean that there's fuel out there that we could start filling up planes. We are trying to get ahead of the game so that when the fuel is available, we can start um, distributing it, or not we, but our FBOs can start distributing it early on. So just to kind of. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Don't be sorry. It's for the update. Anything else? No, I've just been concerned about this issue, and so I've been doing a lot of checking into it for my legacy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the updates. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have the uh, CNR financial update. Um, for time savings, I suggest we can. It's the same as last time. There was no new expenses, so the budget was included in the packet. And if you have any questions, ask. Right. Thank you for making that brief. Uh, next up, we have the roundtable agenda items. The first thing that we have to discuss, and I and I'll say the first two things because they are together. The presentation and discussion regarding the visual flight routes, as well as the presentation and discussion discussion regarding possible Western training grounds. Uh, so we have been working with our consultant HMMH. Uh, this most likely will be their uh, last. Well, this will be their last uh, report to us uh, for the contract that we have with them. So um, Jason and and Jean, thank you for being here, and I'll let you all present. Um. So yes, um, we're uh, glad to report um, 
kind of a bittersweet end here, but we are um, coming to the end of our contract. And uh, I have asked uh, Jason to put together a memo, which you will get after this meeting, as well as a presentation to pretty much uh, discuss what we have done and um, what the next steps are. So, Jason, if you don't mind, go ahead and um, start your presentation. Sure. Thanks, Gene. Thank go you, ahead. J Jason will be louder than Gene is. Go I'm ahead. Sorry, can you... Okay. Thanks, Devin. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. We can see it. Okay, great. Uh, so this is just kind of a recap. Um, like Gene said, we have a uh, much more in-depth 10-page uh, memo uh, that we'll submit to you uh, after the meeting. We felt like this would be a little bit more digestible in this, uh, in this venue. Um, so we just want to go over kind of the things we've accomplished to date and, uh, and where we go from here. On the agenda, we'll go over a little bit of background items, uh, the data collection process, uh, flight procedure development, uh, additional mitigation measures that uh, that you asked us to investigate, including traffic patterns and the creation of additional uh, the Western training grounds, and then final steps and submission to the FAA. So this won't be news to anybody. Uh, obviously, Rocky Mountain Metro is uh, has a large number of operations, which has increased exponentially over the you know the past number of years. According to the FAA's uh, terminal area forecast, by 2050, uh, they're anticipating somewhere around 320,000 operations. Uh, it's home to several fixed wing and helicopter flight schools, and, and that uh, those schools seem to be uh, the crux of a lot of the issues that, that we're facing with the, with the training flights that go to the training grounds, uh, going over the populated areas and, and noise sensitive areas. Um, you know, in years past and, and up to present, there's been a growing number of complaints, community concern uh, regarding the negative impacts from the increased flight traffic and uh, identified flight procedures were, were one of the potential mitigation uh, measures against the negative impacts uh, that the CNR wanted to investigate. So the first step was looking uh, for the location of the VFR training grounds, uh, the VFR practice areas. And primarily the ones are that the uh, the pilots from Rocky Mountain use are the northern practice areas, and these are uh, as seen on this left uh, image here. But they also have additional training areas to the south, uh, to the southeast, and uh, and a few more training areas uh, north of these training grounds, and and also on the other side of Denver. If anybody wants more information on those, the Colorado General uh, or Colorado Pilots Association has a is a great resource. Uh, for information on the practice areas. So after that, we asked all the communities and uh, in uh, contributing members to the the roundtable to uh, consult with their communities and come up with, you know, uh, local noise sensitive area maps. And so we received all of the individual maps from the communities and and compiled them into uh, to one, you know, master map of noise sensitive areas uh, that we were trying to avoid. And as you can see, uh, you know, most of the paths up to the northern training grounds um, would encounter you know, noise sensitive areas unless they went uh, pretty far to the east. So one of the other factors that we had to look into was the current operational environments. So that's not only the operations that Rocky Mountain has, but also the operations and, and charted flight procedures for all of the other airports in the region, mainly Denver International. As uh, so we looked at flight paths into Denver, out of Denver, uh, Denver's Class Bravo, which sits on top uh, of the eastern portion of Rocky Mountains Class Delta. Uh, we had to avoid, you know, uh, like instrument flight procedures that are that are already uh, established into these airports, uh, while also trying to maintain the flight paths over roadways or other uh, like visually identifiable landmarks and um, and try and stay as far away from the noise sensitive areas as we can. I understand that uh, that, you know, the majority of those flight paths up to the north are going right through uh, noise sensitive areas, but that was just kind of, you know, we tried to keep them over top of of major roadways and uh, and if those, um, you know, turn out to not 
impact the noise or not reduce the noise in a in a positive direction, um, then I I doubt that they would keep something like that. They would they would continue to look for additional uh, VFR you know routes that uh, that maybe head a little bit further east. But I'll get to that in a little bit later when we talk to the FAA. So here are the, some of the maps. Here are uh, two examples of the VFR flight procedures. So we can see the ones on the left uh, uh, depicts runway 30 uh, departures and uh, arrivals uh, from the northern training areas. So you'll see the three uh, routes to the west um, you go right through the noise sensitive areas. One of the hopes that we were we were trying to to get is that the aircraft we were hoping that the aircraft would be at a uh, significant enough altitude by the time they got to those noise sensitive areas that it wouldn't be a concern. After talking with the flight schools, uh, which we 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 talked to after uh, the development of these procedures, it sounds like that they typically transit to the to the VFR uh, practice areas at an altitude that's going to be impactful regardless. So. Um, so we discussed, you know, unless they had, uh, they take this easternmost path, um, they're probably going to be, uh, you know, trying to maintain themselves over top of a road or a highway, uh, but nevertheless going through a noise sensitive area. So additional mitigation measures that, uh, that we were asked to investigate were uh, changes to the airport traffic pattern as well as the development of additional uh, VFR practice areas. So one of the issues with the with the traffic pattern uh, changes is it's very difficult to make a, you know a blanket uh, hard and fast change to a uh, VFR traffic pattern. ATC has a limited number of tools in their tool belt to provide for the safe and efficient flow of air traffic uh, into and out of Rocky Mountain Metro, and their traffic pattern is one of those uh, tools. And that traffic pattern expands and contracts as necessary uh, to accommodate, you know, uh, more flights, less flights, uh, flight uh, aircraft with different performance characteristics, um, you know, emergency aircraft, all kinds of different uh, variables uh, would cause a traffic pattern to change size. So, you know, all, we we do uh, still agree with previous recommendations. Uh, try and keep the the pattern as close in as close in and tight as possible. Uh, maintain best climb uh, rate of climb uh, initially uh, on takeoff. Uh, restrict uh, intersection departures so the aircraft get the full use of the runway, um, allowing them to climb faster. Um, and basically, you know, just having ATC be cognizant of trying to avoid uh, the noise sensitive areas to the maximum extent possible. Uh, one of the additional mitigation measures was the investigation of a an additional uh, creation of an addi additional um, VFR practice area to the west of Rocky Mountain Metro. So one of the issues uh, when we were, we had our meetings with the FAA and the local flight schools, uh, one of the issues with uh, putting the uh, potential new VFR practice area out to the west is one, the proximity to uh, the Rocky Mountains. Um, and some of the pilots in the audience may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the word I got from the flight schools is that you know, kind of uh, at the very westernmost part of the front range, uh, you can get some some pretty interesting weather phenomenon, including wind, uh, which would make that an ill-advised location uh, for for novice pilots uh, attempting to to do their training. So, if we move it a little bit further east, uh, still west of the airfield, but a little bit further east uh, uh, from the mountains, we start running into uh, Rocky Mountains class delta, and so the question was posed uh, at the last meeting that we were a part of, uh, why can't we put the class Delta, or I'm sorry, why can't we put the VFR practice area inside the class Delta um, or co-located with the class Delta, you know, in the same space. And at that time, uh, I, I, I may have said that there was, you know, regulations against that um, or that there was uh, some stipulation that said you couldn't do that. So. We've looked into that. Uh, I've requested the AT, uh, FAA uh, give us an opinion on uh, on that matter. But after you know extensive investigation, it, it doesn't look like there is any federal regulation uh, explicitly prohibiting uh, the establishment of a, of a practice area within the class delta. However, I, I still stand by uh, my original thoughts that that would also be ill-advised because 
like the VFR or like the traffic pattern, uh, the class Delta airspace is uh, constructed for a purpose. It's uh, established for a purpose, and it's one of ATC's tools uh, to, to provide for the safe and effective, uh, safe and efficient flow of air traffic into and out of uh, Rocky Mountain Metro. If you were to reduce the size of that class Delta airspace, the class so class Delta airspace, um, it can have a uh, you know small variations in size from airport to airport uh, across the country. Um, but typically it is, uh, the size of the class Delta is, um, is constructed so it can accommodate, uh, you know, the typical annual operations that that airport would, uh, would anticipate. So if you were to reduce the size of the class Delta uh, at Rocky Mountain, you are reducing ATCs, uh, effectiveness in, in providing for that safe and effective, safe and efficient flow of, of air traffic. Um, additionally, if you were to, you know, not reduce uh, the size of the class Delta, but you were to put the, the VFR practice area within the confines of the class Delta, you run into an issue uh, with communication. So VFR practice areas are uh, typically have their own dedicated frequency. Now, the reason for that is because they're not under positive control from ATC. Uh, they're not getting vectors. They're not getting climbs or descents from ATC while they're established inside these these training areas. It's uh, in essence, it's it's VFR, so it's uh, CNB seen. So one of the ways that they're able to uh, provide their own separation is you know by looking out the windows and also by uh, you know position calls or other uh, other calls on the dedicated frequency to other aircraft that are, are participating uh, in the VFR practice area. So if you have a VFR practice area inside the class Delta, uh, it raises a number of issues on whether or not you keep the, the practice area with its own uh, you know, single frequency assignment, in which case uh, you would have aircraft inside of ATC's class Delta, but not on their frequency. They could monitor ATC's frequency, but then they wouldn't be able to monitor guard frequency. Um, which could also cause issues, or you have them on ATC's frequency, um, the tower's frequency, while they're established in the in the VFR practice area inside the class delta. Uh, but that is just going to clog up the frequency, or has the potential to clog up the frequency and uh, inundate with a, a inundate ATC with a with a bunch of radio transmissions that uh, they don't need to hear, and that could distract them from from making the calls that they they do need to make. Um, so. All of that is not to say that it's not worth investigating uh, because, you know, um, during my time as an air traffic controller, one thing that we always used to say is, is that anything can be accomplished with, uh, with the proper coordination. So um, I think it's still, still worth investigating. Um, but, you know, one of the, you know, one of the reasons that VFR practice areas uh, are developed the way they are and why they're, uh, um, you know why they're a favorite of you know flight schools is because they can be developed and established outside of the purview, uh, more or less, of the FAA. You know, local flight schools uh, pilots they can get together, uh, do their research, uh, find a piece of airspace that isn't typically used where they wouldn't cause any undue burden uh, on established flight flight procedures, and establish a new um, you know VFR practice area with an open frequency. Uh, the ATC or uh, the FAA um, has little, you know, uh, you know, in, in talking with, with uh, the FAA, they have, you know, as long as there isn't any issues arising that they're made aware of from the VFR practice area, they typically don't pay too much attention to it. Um, so if you were to establish a VFR practice area within the class Delta, that would necessitate approval from ATC, uh, which I think would be hard to come by. But Still worth discussing with ATC. Uh, I have posed the question to both ATC and uh, the FAA's Denver office. I uh, have yet to receive a reply, but if you know if I do get a reply, I'll make sure to forward that information. So final steps in submission to the FAA. Uh, so throughout the process, you know, we tried to listen to comments from community members. Uh, I think the establishment of a, a Western uh, training area uh, was raised by a community member at one of the noise roundtables, and also, uh, you know, previous comments and uh, presentations on the reduction in size of the, uh, you know, the tower traffic pattern. 
Uh, we tried to pay attention to uh, the concerns and uh, and do what we could to help mitigate some of those uh, noise impacts. Uh, towards the end of the process, we were able to uh, secure a number of meetings with the FAA, uh, where we talked about uh, you know the viability of these uh, traffic patterns, or uh, I'm sorry, the, these uh, VFR flight procedures. So one thing that I want to make really clear is that in these meetings. Um, FAA and uh, you know the lo local flight schools were all made aware of the underlying uh, principle uh, you know that was kind of guiding us with the establishment of these flight procedures. It is never, it was never, and will never be the intention uh, of the FAA or uh, you know or HMMH to just just distribute uh, or move noise from one location to another. Uh, that wasn't our intention with the with the the, the routes and uh, ATC, FAA, and the flight schools were made aware that you know we want to maintain these flight paths over you know heavily trafficked uh, roadways where the you know where potentially the ambient noise um, would allow the aircraft to transit uh, you know through those areas um, with less of a noise impact or to to remain clear of uh, the uh, the noise sensitive areas that were established by the communities, uh, so they know that uh, they're looking into um, the viability of all the procedures. Uh, they also have um, the option of creating their own new procedures uh, with those principles in mind. Um, one thing that was raised by uh, one of the flight schools that I think uh, ATC was also going to investigate is you know one issue that they had with the uh, VFR flight paths uh, were with multiple flight paths. Uh, there was the potential for ingress and egress routes to overlap. And while they could still vertically separate uh, those flight paths, uh, they, ATC uh, seemed more amenable to the idea of having, you know, one ingress, one egress route per runway configuration to each of the training areas. Uh, however, you know, as uh, as has been mentioned uh, numerous times in this meeting, uh, if you reduce the uh, the options for transiting to the northern training areas into one flight pattern, um, they are aware that you know they'll have to make sure that that avoids all noise sensitive areas. No question about it. So, um, also there was a recommendation for. A course rules uh, type environment, and that this kind of plays uh, plays right along with the with the VFR flight procedures, uh, where a course rules environment is basically ATC uh, will have regular regular meetings with all of the flight schools, and because flight schools will typically have a, a clientele or, or, or student base. Uh, that's constantly changing. Uh, you're going to get new pilots, uh, pilots with with varying abilities, always coming to the airfield uh, and flying. It's important for ATC to establish that relationship and give uh, give briefings at regular intervals, so that you know every new pilot can hear the brief. The briefings would typically include uh, you know the VFR procedures uh, as they are um, approved, uh, if it comes to that, and uh, also best practices. Uh, noise abatement procedures, anything else that helps, uh, you know, kind of reduce the noise impact uh, that the communities are currently experiencing. So we have submitted all the materials uh, that we've developed thus far uh, to the FAA. Um, there is a, from my understanding, there is a committee uh, comprised of FAA personnel from the from the Denver office, uh, local areas, as well as uh, ATC uh, from a number of facilities uh, that are a part of a, a collective group that analyze and go over projects like this, um, potential implementations that would make changes to established flight uh, flight patterns, and um, so they're tip they're they are in that process right now, uh, still analyzing the flight procedures for viability. Um, last word we got from the FAA was that it would take uh, a number of months uh, for them to do their due diligence and uh, and go over every permutation of, of kind of you know situations that may arise with the establishment of these procedures uh, before they can give their approval uh, or denial. Um, 
you know, for the viability of the procedures. So next steps would be uh, the FAA will come back with a determination um, on the viability of the procedures. Uh, if they think the procedures are viable, uh, then they'll begin the process of implementing the procedures, uh, which will, you know, be an all hands on deck effort, uh, ATC, uh, the flight schools. And also, I think it'd be very important for the community to continue to uh, voice their concerns if they don't see any, uh, you know, positive uh, impact uh, from the establishment of the VFR procedures. Uh, the FAA doesn't want to uh, make the situation any worse. You know, they're they're not looking to move the noise from one community uh, to another community. And um, so if the procedures don't work and uh, and things are worse or the same as before, um, then there's nothing stopping them from from removing procedures that they implemented. Nothing has to be uh, permanent uh, that isn't productive or useful. So uh, it's important that they that they try. Um, to see if there there can be any relief generated from these procedures, um, and if there's not, then then you know they can continue to investigate additional flight paths uh, that may provide relief or uh, additional mitigation measures. Um, but the conversation has been started, um, and the FAA uh, I think is very understanding of you know Rocky Mountain Metro, uh, the community noise roundtable's position, and. Uh, you know, they were more than willing to work with with me, and I, I think they'll be willing to work with you in the future. Um, you know, to keep the process moving forward. And I think that's that brings us up to you today. Any questions? Great. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Gene, for your reports. Uh, we do have some questions. So, sure. Jason, this is John Marriott. Hey, the question I have for you is. So, you know, you guys were engaged to investigate these VFR routes and you guys have done a, a, a big amount of work to investigate the situation and develop, you know, what's what's possible for VFR routes. And lastly, you said, so this has been turned over for the FAA to the FAA to, to look at, but it seems to me the part that's kind of missing is the, the public comment on these decisions or, or these possibilities. You know, when we started this, we talked in our layman's terms and general terms about, you know, where should planes go and where shouldn't they go and concentrating noise or dispersing noise. But we were shooting at kind of hypotheticals. Now that you've done all this work, you've come up with some possible specifics. And I'm wondering if before the FAA were to get deep in it and rule on it, is there some part of their process or some part of our process that should incur that should include, you know, a, a public comment period or a time frame by which the public can look at these results and then and then weigh in on them. And you know, as we've heard tonight in in public comment, there are some people who are positive towards this type of a thing and some that are not. And now that we've got some specifics, should we hear from them before we progress further? Yeah, this Gene, can you hear me any better? Yes, yes thank you. Okay, um, so I I think. The process of what the roundtable has been doing and getting those comments in, like today at the beginning of the meeting, um, should continue. And uh, I I believe the next step that Jason alluded to is that the FAA would come back with these are viable or not viable. And if they are viable, it's still up to, I think, this group to tell the FAA whether or not they want them to proceed to implement those procedures. And so um, it's it's really up to the round table to determine at that point whether they want to proceed. And so I would recommend continuing to get those comments in and trying to do that evaluation. Um, and one of the things is that having those four egress and ingress routes does help disperse it. And so if the FAA does come back with only one, um, that could pose a problem unless it's the easternmost one. But um, I would I would just say that I would put it on the roundtable shoulders to make sure that um, all community input is taken into account before you um, ask the FAA to go ahead and implement. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments at this point? Commissioner Sultan. Thanks. Yeah, um, Director Marriott. My my understanding was we didn't even know if these routes were viable. 
Sure. Like if they were even doable. So we were just finding out in the FAA, are these even pathways that are possible for us to consider? Um, I, I suppose, I guess you, we've expended all of the money in the contract at this point. And so I would hope tonight we can kind of have a, a discussion about like what are our next steps and like what are likely outcomes. So that's where I hope we have, where I hope the conversation goes. For sure. To me, I was kind of looking at it as a chicken and egg thing, you know, that, that we didn't know what the possibilities would be. We now don't know if the FAA finds it viable, but if if the public finds them unviable, is does the FAA continue to go on? You know, that's, at which at which point goes with you know, where, sort of where, what, does, where does it That's end? sort of what I'm saying. So Boulder County collected public comment to develop our noise sensitive areas. Sure. And so all of the areas for the four routes that go north are over noise sensitive areas yeah. that we would object to. Um, and I heard you say four areas, but just want to remind you that you did develop some BFR routes to the south as well. So it makes the number higher than four. Just ask a follow up, just do it here. Please Trying to do in the process. Please do it here. So we submitted noise sensitive areas to try to avoid those noise sensitive areas, but then the routes that were created went through those noise sensitive areas. Am I, is it, am I? Correct? Nope, that's correct. That's well, correct. Did, yeah, one of the things that Jason said though is that in doing so, we also lengthen the distance between the airport and those areas to try to get the aircraft higher. But as we heard from the flight schools, they may not be all that much higher as a result of that. So, I, so you know, something additional that I want to touch on is, you know, in speaking with the FAA and kind of taking their considerations uh, and their comments uh, to heart when developing these procedures is, you know, we're kind of forced to, you know, I guess, you know, serve two masters uh, to get to a a reasonable outcome, right? So, if you look at the noise sensitive areas, uh, it it encompasses almost you know virtually everything due north of, of Rocky Mountain on the way to those those training areas. So, as it as it stands today, I mean, those aircraft are flying through noise sensitive areas, right? So, the intention was, you know. The pilots are going to be uh, the pilots in the flight schools. Are going to be unwilling to adopt a procedure that adds, you know, uh, additional flying miles, right? Um, you know, unnecessarily uh, to their flight path, flight flight paths to the northern training areas when they could just fly how they do today and not change anything. So, you know, the intention was that even those flight paths that go through the noise sensitive areas, we were hoping that uh, one, they would be over, uh, you know, heavily trafficked, well established. Uh, roadways or highways. So, like I said before, so that the ambient noise in that area uh, will help drown out some of the the, the aircraft noise, uh, but also that they would be at an altitude uh, that was sufficient enough to also reduce the impact. Um, it sounds like after talking to the the flight schools that uh, they hardly ever get up to an altitude. Uh, I think you know one uh, you know due to performance characteristics uh, and just the field elevation at Rocky Mountain Metro. I mean, you're 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 already starting so high uh, at over 5,000 feet um, that they typically don't get up that high. Also, you're you're restricted on the e on the eastern side uh, with Denver's Class Bravo. So th there's a number of restrictions, both geographically and uh, in, in part of the uh, national airspace system, that make it difficult. So uh, I think you know all that's to say uh, we were trying our best to uh, give the pilots an option. Uh, when there was uh, very little option, I guess, uh, for pathways uh, around noise sensitive areas up to the northern training grounds. Okay, thank you. And just to confirm, if I may, go okay. for it, please. So, the only stakeholder engagement that has been done so far is through this body for these routes. Is that correct? Boulder County is done. Stakeholder Boulder County is done on the on the noise sensitive areas submission. Okay. And I just, and I just uh, so HMMH talked about some of their stakeholding that they did, right? They met with the flight schools as well. Flight yeah. schools. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And my final question for you, thank you, Jason and Jean. Um, are you aware if the FAA is also, it seemed like you referenced this. I just want to confirm. Is the FAA also working on flight proposed flight routes sort of parallel to this? No, 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 no. So I, I, I think I, that, that may, I may have, uh, um, you know, said that in a confusing way. So, 
what I meant to say, or you know, hopefully this is is clear, is that um, you know we tried to be explicit with the FAA what the underlying intention of the flight routes were, and that these flight routes, these proposed routes, while they were our best effort, are not the be all and end all uh, only solutions for VFR flight procedures. So you know, the FAA, ATC. Uh, you know, local pilots and in uh, the flight schools, uh, they have a local knowledge that that basically can't be replaced. Um, so if they determine that they have uh, you know more viable options after looking at the the proposed procedures, or after they implement, they're like, oh, you know, if we shifted this one a little bit further, that option is open to them as long as the community's behind it. Um, so that's all I'm trying to say is that uh, if these procedures don't work. Uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't procedures out there that won't work, and uh, the FAA is aware um, that they will, you know, continue to try and find if that's if that's your wish, uh, continue to try and find paths uh, that avoid noise sensitive areas and reduce the uh, the negative impact that uh, that you're currently experiencing. Yeah, I could add to that. What we found is that really the FAA and the flight schools want to help. <laughs> Um, they want to um, find a solution. They're just scratching their heads a little bit now, too, as to whether, you know, what that solution really is. So I think the good news in all of this, even though the FAA has taken a while to review the procedures that we gave them, is that one, they, they understand the problem and they want to help solve the problem. So if these don't do it, it's like Jason said, it's, don't, don't feel that you're done at that point because the lines of communication with the flight schools and the FAA have been open and um, I just encourage you this body to continue keeping those lines of discussion open and working with them to help solve this problem. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, I do have some questions uh, in your comments. Uh, Jason and Gene, thank you so much for your work on all of this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I wish we had gotten further along in this process before your contract was coming to an end, uh, and especially with the potential of still having months to go before we are, before we even get to the next stage of this conversation, um, and then potentially even months uh, after that point, in terms of the implementation of this, so uh, we still have a, we are still are uh, maybe not early in process, but we are not quite towards the end of the process either. So um, I think that there's still work to be done uh, at this point. Um, thank you for meeting with the uh, the, the flight schools, uh, FAA, uh, ATC. <clears throat> Just looking at my notes, make sure I got everything. Oh, um, so the uh, the ten page report. So you'll be sending that out to the community noise roundtable. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Whoever you'd like me to send it to, I was going to send it to you, Devin, um, uh, for you to distribute. But if you want me to send it, if there's an email for the for the community noise roundtable, I, I can send it wherever you like. If you want to send it to me? I'll send it right to uh, Ben Miller uh, with the airport. We'll get this on to the community noise roundtable uh, page for all the public to see us, and then we'll make sure that the it's just to all the members of the roundtable. Um, and then I would assume Ben, uh, along with that, we'll make sure that we post tonight's presentation on there as well. So Gene and, and Jason, if you'll make sure that that presentation you send to us so that we can get that posted onto our CNR website as well. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so at this point, uh, do we have any more conversations regarding the visual flight routes or the Western training grounds at this point? Okay. Yes. I just want to address some of the comments that you made about next steps. To me, I feel like we need to, I mean, we can kind of discuss them, but until we know whether or not the FAA can affect the engineering committee, that as far as the noise sensitive areas. Um, it's hard to say what the next steps are. You know, if the FAA comes back and says totally not viable, then that's different than them coming back and saying this might potentially work. So, trying to understand like what what you were hoping there. Yeah, thank you for the question. I really appreciate that. So, if I'm voting no in any case on these routes, I don't really understand the point of studying them further. 
as if one member votes no, then they're not going to be adopted by the board. So I mm -hmm. guess maybe that's the point of my That's comment. a fair point. So then the other part of your, your comment, mm -hmm. though, was next step. So in your mind, voting no, then what would be the next step? Of that, so I just wanted to understand what are, so I, no, I mean this in no way disparagingly, but HMMH has a financial interest in continuing to study this indefinitely, right? And so I guess I just want us to think about logical conclusions and understand like what are what are actions that we may or may not take. And like if we are to write a contract, what are the terms so we get whatever deliverable? Like we had a finite amount of money and hours to spend this time and didn't necessarily get out of the contract maybe a deliverable, right? Like we expended all the money for the time that they spent on it and they've done a ton of work. Um, but we didn't really give it deliverable. So if there is interest from the group in continuing to study something, I would want to understand what the terms of the contract would look like so we would get a deliverable that would have like meaningful <clears throat> something meaningful for the group to act on. That's that's kind of what I meant by next step. Well, I think that's fair because I mean from my perspective, I would think that we would want to know what what we believe that term should be. So then we said it's a little bit of expectation. I think some of this is some extent you don't know unless you try some stuff. I think we've been in that territory quite a bit. Um, so just trying to understand it, those are all fair points. The other thing I wanted to bring up uh, for your benefit from you know just what Westminster put forward, I, I think it's a difficult challenge that we've asked because if you look at what Westminster's noise sensitive areas are, it's barely everything around the airport. So I mean you can't you can't get out of the airport and fly over Westminster and, and not be considered noise sensitive. And I think most of the communities are very similar as far as what they put forward. And I think it's you know, to the point of what a lot of the residents have said here tonight, you know, nobody wants it moved over their community in lieu of a different community. So um, I just wanted to bring that up because, it, I mean, and at some level, it, you know, feels like a pretty daunting task when your staff gives you back a map that's basically everything. It's like, okay, well, where are they expected to go? So, well, and I think that's great, Director. And, and that's why the Western airspace training area is interesting and why they were looking at it for us. And if you look, there are some pilots that under tower control do do maneuvers and practice there. They're obviously under tower control because there is a Delta airspace. I have lots of maps that you can look at and, and I can show you that there are several pilots that from time to time when there's not a lot of activity going on, ATC lets them go over there underneath their control. Um, and other airports modify their airspace. Um, to different shapes, they're not always like perfect circles, and like there are a number of different things that people have done that allow for creative solutions. So I do think like that area, if you look at our noise sensitive area, is the only space that's not identified, and it's super challenging. I think you've presented a fair, very fair point. Yeah, and I'm, I would thank you what you said about the idea of the Western training field to be that was something that sounded like it could be full of big things work, but. Understand the challenges. So. I just want to throw out that a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, we did a beta test in which we had planes for a month fly up 287, not go through Superior, but just go follow 287 to go up to the Northern Training Ground. So when we're talking about why don't they go over, you know, other areas, we tried that. The complaints increased. Why do you sit? Why? I was surprised. You're that surprised. Look, there's a lot of there's a lot of houses around. Oh, there. if you but if you go up to 87 up the the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. not in the neighborhoods, not over the houses. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's. Yeah, the houses are right next. Uh, to public. You. This is there. not a conversation uh, between the neighborhoods all, all around. That Thank road. you. Right. Well, right. no, I understand that. Right. But so that's why I believe that the complaint right. increased. Right. So when they are looking at where does it go, that to me that there would be a logical thing that we would be looking at, but it was not filed. Well, right. let's and let's remember with that beta test. So we had signaled to our flight schools that we would like to to, to test this route out. Uh, that was uh, there was no compliance with or very little compliance with that. There was very little uh, willingness on the behalf of the pilots and the flight schools to actually follow that path. Uh, the uh, maps were almost identical 
before we implemented that and after we implemented it during that implementation. So the big thing that we asked for was please send your comments so that we have that information. Of course, we had increased uh, com uh, complaints because we asked for them, but the routes themselves did not change. They still had the same amount of routes uh, over all the oh, northern yes. communities as well. So, uh, the, you know, there wasn't much data that we actually gathered from uh, that beta test. So I just wanted to make sure that you have that context. Uh, do we have any more conversation regarding the visual flight routes, uh, Western training grounds? Uh, the next agenda item that we do have is the contract update with HMMH, just so that we can have that preliminary conversation, or we can actually have a full conversation on this. But just wanted to get your sense of, uh, are, are, do, are we wanting to, um, actually, I'll ask this question first. Can we move on to that agenda item, or do we still have uh, questions and comments regarding the visual flight routes and the Western training grounds at this point? Okay, so let's continue on uh, with our agenda item C, which is the contract update with HMMH. Um, at this point, uh, the contract with HMMH, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, uh, will be complete. Uh, this was their last deliverable um, in terms of their last invoice that the prior meeting that they had before, they were 99% complete with their contract. Uh, and and expenditures. Uh, this will be the final invoice. They will submit one more final invoice uh, to the uh, limit of that contract. Uh, so at this point, uh, our contract is complete uh, with HMMH. So uh, we have a decision point to make uh, regarding HMMH, and that is whether do we continue uh, and and sign a new agreement with HMMH, or do we not continue at this point and we wait for that feedback from the FAA. Yeah. What what would be the task that HMMH would be being asked to do? Yeah, I think that uh, so they've been really our go between between the FAA and this group. So they're the ones kind of doing the back and forth. So that would be, I think, their main objective at this point. But again, to their point, what we're waiting for is the response from the FAA, and that's whether these flight routes could work or not. But that's already been turned over to the FAA. That doesn't right. require any more any more work by HMMH at this point to at least find out if what's been proposed so far is viable or not. Yeah, I, I would ask that uh, of Jason. Jason, between now and the FAA's response, is there any additional work uh, that would be required of HMMH? <clears throat> Negative, I don't think so. Uh, the FAA, kind of the ball's in their court at this point. Uh, they have all the information, and I, I think we're all just waiting on them for uh, to make a determination before we move forward. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I I, I would, and, and until that step is taken, I certainly wouldn't take any further contractual steps with agent because we don't know what we would be, what would we, what would we be seeking even at this point? So for me, I, for me, I think there's two very, very large next steps, which is in, in whichever order, but it's, uh, you know, response by the uh, FAA about the viability of any of this proposal. Number one and number two would be the public outreach or public response to these these proposals. Um, and I think those two steps have to happen first before we before we go try to push the ball any further. Great, thank you. Yes, go first. So um, for HMMH, did the FAA give you an expectation of the timeline it would take to get back to us with the viability of these? No, uh, they didn't give us an expectation. Um, they weren't very specific. Uh, we did get um, a comment that it would take many months uh, for them to to go over and analyze the the flight procedures. And in my experience, that's for a number of reasons. One, uh, coordinating amongst amongst the individuals, getting schedules to to match up to be able to uh, to do this analysis. Um, but also, um, it's not as simple as just establishing VFR flight procedures. So it, you know, the FAA, um, you know, it's kind of going to be their imprimatur on it if these get established and utilized by ATC, you know, which is a part of the FAA. So. You know, FAA wants to make sure that they go through, do their due diligence, and uh, and really analyze. Uh, like I said before, every permutation uh, of different variables or complexities that may arise uh, with the establishment of these VFR flight procedures, because in essence, you would be altering or shifting uh, proven and established 
uh, flight procedures that you know the ATC kind of works with today, and and uh, and they know to work for in you know from their point of view as far as safety and efficiency for for the aircraft. Uh, so um, I think that's what they're doing. Uh, the timeline of of a few months um, seems pretty consistent uh, with with other projects we've done with the FAA in the past. Um, so that's all the information I have. Thank you. I'm in the same position as uh, Councillor Marriott as far as like, I don't see that there's a, a next step necessarily in front of us. And then from Westminster's perspective, I certainly would need to know what that next step is. And if it's going to cost something, I would have to get that approved by my council before I could even really speak on it anyway. So I think the logical next thing is to actually find out what the FAA says and then have a discussion as a group about it um, with enough time before a decision then to bring it back to the Westminster over to Westminster Council and see what the majority would want. Okay. Uh, I have a question. So and it just popped in and I'm sorry, I'm gonna kind of have to go back into the agenda. So uh, if we have a member, if, if the FAA says these routes can work, and at that point we have public comment, um, and then we have a vote to uh, move forward with these routes or signaling to move forward with these routes to the FAA. And one jurisdiction's votes no on that. Are we back to square one? So, so I will say that in discussions with the FAA, one thing that the FAA was concerned about, if you remember, Devin, uh, in our first meeting, uh, we had to come back and and have the the roundtable. Uh, I can't remember if it was a vote or just to uh, explicitly state. Uh, that they approved these flight procedures. So I guess the FAA has had some concerns in the past um, where you know, they do all this work to, to, to try and move forward with something. And I'm not saying specifically here at Rocky Mountain, um, at other airports uh, where a noise roundtable uh, has, has agreed to uh, the development of, of you know, some procedure that, that's gonna change at the airport. Uh, they do all the work, uh, find out is viable, only to find out that uh, that the communities uh, do not want these procedures, and uh, and nobody can agree on on whether or not they want to move forward. Um, so that's why they made us come back to the to the roundtable uh, and get that uh, that explicit yes, so that John uh, from the FAA could hear that, and then uh, and then move forward. So I think from FAA's perspective, uh, they are already operating under the assumption that these are approved, and that uh, if they find them viable, um, that that there is nothing kind of uh, Standing in their way from from implementing these procedures uh, as soon as they as soon as they see fit, I guess. Okay. Thank so you. if the, if there is concern, I would just uh, you know I would I would make the FAA aware of that, I guess. Yeah. So the, from my perspective, the vote that we took was that we were interested to understand the viability of the procedures. That we were interested to look at the viability of the procedures, and so yep. I would make a motion um, to. Say that we want to accept the procedures and just move forward. I'm happy to make the motion here. Oh, I don't. I don't even know. I mean, I guess signaling that you aren't going to be accepting those procedures. I mean, we don't. I mean, even if it, even if it failed, even if right. that motion That's failed, why. it doesn't really matter because we need it unanimous. We need a consent uh, for that. So I, I guess you're more than welcome to make, make that motion, and we'll. Because you made a motion, and if there's a second uh, to that motion, to not accept, then please rephrase your motion so I don't. Do you sure. want me to make it as a positive motion that I'll vote against, or a negative <laughs> motion that I'll vote for? I'm happy to. I always like voting here. for something as opposed to voting against something. So, uh, so I will make a motion that we do not that Boulder County does not accept the proposed pass. I think ultimately that, that uh, the CNR not accept the proposed pass. Yeah. Or not move forward. I accept the friendly amount. Second it. We have a second. Oh, uh, and, and now we have discussion. Yeah, I have a question about, about your motion. Mm -hmm. And the question I would have was was there any paths that would have been acceptable to Boulder County? Well, so we asked for studying of a southern path, and even today the consultant said that they're looking at four paths, and they submitted four paths, and those are all the paths to the north. And like we asked for a western training ground to be explored, and it's like, well, it's early, and we don't know, and there's no answer. So like we, we asked for a number of things that were disregarded. I guess my response would be, I think in the fourth, there is a southern uh, VFR path. 
on, on. I haven't seen the report. Okay. There's some report. I've not gotten a copy. It was it was in the presentation, and I've I've distributed the southern paths to the uh, round table as well. Right. So so that's number one, and number two is um, they did work on a western training grounds. Now the, the the outcome might not be the outcome the Boulder County would have favored, but is 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 that the the genesis of your opposition to the to the potential paths, or is is it the paths themselves that that there's an objection to? And if if so, what were that were there alternatives that would have been sufficient? I'm just trying to understand what Boulder County's position in this would it is. Yeah, so we have been pretty clear that we're looking to understand if there are other alternatives to just putting all of the training areas in Boulder County. And all of the flights over Boulder yeah. County, the vast preponderance of the flights over Boulder County and the residents in Boulder County. And and so even as it was presented today, the solutions were to put to concentrate all the flights over Boulder County. That was what was presented today to us. Yeah, I guess to me, I, well, um, what I see as was presented was the existing condition, the existing traffic was some proposed paths to handle the existing traffic. And that seemed to me to be the, the goal of this of this whole exercise was to, to manage the existing traffic and I'm, I'm not, not to rewrite the book on the situation. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I think if I wasn't the one voting no, I think Lafayette would vote no. I think it's likely the Superior representative would vote no. I think it's likely the Louisville representative would vote no. I'm just trying to get to next steps. I'm yeah. really actually not trying to be difficult. It's like, We've, I, I think in good faith, everyone's come together. We're having really good conversation, trying to figure out are there ways to mitigate this? And we've said that we don't want to move going from one area to another. And so I'm just like, we continue month after month to not kind of get to the next step. And so when I was saying, like, what are the next steps? I'm, I'm just trying to help us get to a conclusion. Fair, so fair. I, I was willing to just sort of be the heavy and be like, it's my fault. But I actually think there's probably several people around the table that at the end of the day are going to end up having to vote no for these rounds. Yeah, fair enough. Any other discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, Say the motion again. The, the motion is to not accept the VFR rounds as presented. So, so, so a yes means you don't accept them and a no means you. So that means don't we don't want them. the FAA to look okay. at them to see if they're viable. We just want to stop and not do anything. We would communicate that to the to, to the FAA to, to not continue to uh, look at these routes. And that includes the four north routes, but also the south route and also the western training ground. So that's the whole thing that each MMH has put together. Let me ask a clarifying question. So, uh, Jason, you submitted the four uh, VFR routes to the north. Did you also submit routes to the south as well? Correct. And and we posed the question about the development or creation of the of the practice area out to the west of uh, Rocky Mountain. Well, I'm specifically talking about the VFR routes, and none of the existing training areas are FAA training areas. We're, they're frequencies that the pilots used to practice, like an FAA sanctioned training area is a totally different deal. And so we can continue as individuals or air traffic control or Jefferson County who owns the airport to explore the training ground, regardless of this motion I'm making. I'm just talking about the VFR route. So you're talking about the north, the VFR routes going north, the four routes going north, that's what you're talking about. I am not going to be able to vote on the route. I'm so I have laid out several times that I'm not going to vote about routes over other people's communities. I'm going to defer and and I and I appreciate them. what you're not going to do. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Yeah. So, but I'm trying to looking, figure out what this motion is. I I will not be able to support the VFR routes that are presented if we were to vote on them. So that's what the motion is about. Uh, and, and just to clarify, all VFR routes, we're not talking north, just north, we're not talking. Yeah, and I'm just saying I'm not okay. going to weigh in on whether the south one is appropriate because that's not my community. And I just wanted to clarify. Great. Any other comments, questions on the motion? Yes. I mean, we as a group are all voting on things that impact each other's communities. And I, I mean, this is kind of a partnership. so I. I mean, anything that we do is going to impact each other's community. So how do how do you propose that we do the business if you're not willing to vote on something 
that may impact my community. I'm willing to vote on it. I'm looking to you for guidance on what you think is right for your community. I'm not going to tell you what's right for your community. Um, I, I guess with that being said, I, I even am a little frustrated we're even voting on it yet because I'd like to hear what the the, the findings of the FAA are. And then we're we spent money on this. We, right. we took taxpayer money. We all said we're going to look at this. We made a commitment to each other's communities, and so now we're shooting it down before we even find out. And I, I have to imagine, like my community, I I realized there were going to be parts of it we probably wouldn't have liked. Um, that's part of collaborating with each other's communities, I think, and realizing that there's going to be some give and take with this process. Um, so I'm frustrated that, that that's where we're at with it. But that's just my, my concern about it. I hear you, and I don't feel a lot of give and take. Uh, the preponderance of traffic goes over Boulder County, so there's not a lot of give and take that has happened. We just heard that there are south routes that are in there, and you're saying you don't want to vote on those, and we're throwing out all the I'm just, CFRs. I'm just not making comments on that. I can't vote on this package, and I think the FAA deserves to hear that before they waste a bunch of time and further taxpayer money. FAA is taxpayer money. All of us are taxpayer money. Like It's all taxpayer money. So I do think as soon as we know something's not viable, we should move on. And I don't know. Can can other areas to the north, like, are, would you be able to vote for this thing? I'm not I'm not clear on all of the the conditions and and what which way we should go. Um, I'm disappointed that we put all this money into the research and then not let at least let the FAA weigh in and give us their opinion. I mean, even if it's no, it's not going to work. I most certainly cannot support these routes the way that they're designed through Lafayette at this point. And I think we heard that really clearly from my council on Tuesday, and I've heard it from my community. So I'm happy to keep working on routes. Like I, I do think that yeah. there's a there's a there's a compromise we can find, there's a route we can find. Um, but as it is right now, and as it is currently to the FAA for their <coughs> feedback and for their determination on if it's viable. That's a waste of time as the routes to the north are currently designed. All right. Any other comments on the motion? So, can I clarify something? Yes, ma'am. Did we not vote on this already? We said we were interested in exploring the viability of them, but I think this is just to give the signal that even if it, it's important to let the FAA know that we're not interested in implementing them. <laughs> I think it's a very different motion. Any other questions, comments, before we take a vote on the motion? Yes, of course. Yes. We'll be supporting the project that we're going to vote. Yeah. Since they go through each route, say yes or no, since there's more than the four, it sounds like the south routes are, are open. It's the four northern ones that were announced. I think that we have a motion. I haven't heard that the motion is changing. And so without further discussion or comments, Ben, will you please call the roll? City of Westminster. Yeah. Town of Superior. Present. City of Louisville. Yes. City of Lafayette. Yes. City of Arvada. No. City and County of Broomfield. No. Jefferson County. No. Yes. It doesn't matter. Four no's and three yes. And if we have no votes, <laughs> it's, 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 we don't have to count the votes. Well, it's, 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 no, 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 we have no consensus. Yeah. There was one that <laughs> so, could go forward. So, 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 so it, what? Uh, so the motion, motion, okay, no fails. <laughs> However, um, because we have three jurisdictions that right. are unwilling to move forward with these routes, we really need for this vote to be 100% consensus. So the outcome of this is we will communicate. Um, I, I, will, I will take the lead on that along with the airport and, uh, and I'll reach out to our consultants um, to communicate to the FAA that we do not want them to continue uh, studying these routes and to provide us feedback on this uh, because we have jurisdictions that are not willing to move forward 
uh, with these routes. Okay. Um, so we have now covered our routes. We have now covered our contract, which we are not going to engage at this point with HOMH. Um, the next uh, piece that we have uh, is the update on the voluntary nighttime pattern. Uh, yeah, Ben, if you want to bring that up. Um, I mean, I'm sorry with... to go back, but I'd like to ask yeah. a quick question. So we, we, ta we tabled looking at a contract with them because we wanted to wait for results. Now we know that basically that's been thrown out the window. They're not going to do anything with that. So I think it's a fair question to ask. Does this body want to do anything with the consultant and trying to find a solution? Are we just, what's the next, that's what I asked before, what's the next step from, from this body's perspective? Because I, I feel like we're here to try to make, and I know we have another potential solution ahead of us, but as far as this work, what's the next step? So I, so I would suggest um, that uh, we get through the night, voluntary nighttime pattern, the daytime flight uh, patterns, and then under committee and board member reports, we can tee that conversation up because I think that that's where that needs to be. Of course, during that, we won't have the ability to make any motions at that point. We'll have to put that on the future agenda. But I would suggest that we have that conversation under there. Is that okay? Perfect. Jason, back to you. Great, thank you. Um, the numbers really haven't moved too much since last time. Um, I have provided uh, data supporting uh, the numbers, and those will be on the uh, CNR website going forward. Um, in addition, um, I'm still just up to February 26th on that data. Uh, by Monday, there will be new updated information on it to follow it through uh, this coming Sunday and Monday at 6 a.m. But uh, um, I think if you scroll the bottom part, yeah, it's just um, one more. Thank you. Yeah, we're still since the inception of it, 49% um, compliance overall, and since the meeting of the flight schools on the 13th of October, we're at 73% compliance. Um, we're looking at this, <clears throat> excuse me, as being an opportunity for the summer when it gets warm again, and obviously the pilots are going to start flying later and later past 10 o'clock. That's an opportunity for them to. <laughs> opportunity for them to use the voluntary nighttime procedure to alleviate a lot of the uh, flights over the uh, populated areas. So um, does anybody have any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, great. Um, so daytime wants me get up and do this because I'll be pointing a lot and I'll try to stand to the left, get out of your way, but for everybody in the audience, if I'm in your way at all, yell at me, I will move. Jason, can I, can I ask a question before, before you present this? Because I find myself in a strange spot on this agenda topic. Sure, sure. So my understanding is the town of Superior. I will get to that. Okay. I'm going to answer that. I'm right. just asking you, yep. maybe we should not have this on the agenda to discuss. Because I, I, I'm just, are you going to vote to support this agenda topic tonight? Let's go through this first. And then you'll, yeah, I will, I'm not, I'm not admitting your question. It will be answered. And I'll answer it right away, actually. Um, so. We are. No. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. Okay, can you see? <laughs> if you can't, can you holler? Um, this was brought up to the uh, Town of Superior Board on the 26th, and it's Ashley was in state because she's stealing my thunder here. Right. But I just wanted to say in full disclosure to everybody, the Town of Superior does not support this plan. There were seven of us on the board, four are against it, myself and two other trustees are for this plan. but. We live in a democracy, and I respect their decision. So what I'd like to use tonight in presenting this, because there were a lot of questions last time about tabling the vote, getting some more information on this, and there were some very good questions on my board as well, asking questions going forward. So I'd like to do a presentation, just answering some of those, and use this as a model as we go forward. What can we learn from this? What can we do in the future? What can we try different plans, different things that we can try to push this process will be try to get some sort of solution and you know, relief for our communities. So what we have right now is um, opportunities, but opportunities we have to always push forward. So um, I'm going to present this. I'm going to talk about the current pattern, what it is, what I think it fails in, and what we can do going forward to try to move things in a more direction, a better direction. And I'm also going to talk about access to the training area. I'm going to talk about accessing Boulder County. Lucil and Lafayette as well as trying to get to the southern training areas because these are areas that I felt could overlap with HMMH's work. And I think using this pattern as a study going forward, we can kind of talk about ways where we can get the players 
at a much higher altitude before the cross highway 36 going to the north. And what we can do with the pattern to create a southern route to the future training areas that could pop up south of the airport. Uh, next slide, Ben, please. Um, yeah, just get this one. This is what basically the anatomy of a touch and go pattern is right now. Um, you have your takeoff, your upwind leg, you come to the crosswind leg, do your turn, you continue down your downwind leg to the base leg, and then you come to return to the airport and do your touch and do when you return again. Really simple pattern. That's kind of what we're looking at right now. Next, Ben, please. Thank you. Here's the pattern we have right now. And the issue we're having with this pattern is that, sorry guys, <laughs> in the upwind leg, we're coming to the crosswind turn right as the pilot sits superior. And this is going to become a lot more prominent as the weather gets warmer. The pilots are going to experience a lot thinner air density, so the climbing of the airplane is going to get a lot harder to get to a sufficient altitude. Right now we're seeing they'll be able to turn at 6,200 feet, which is 300 feet below pattern altitude of 6,500 feet, which is roughly, you were take a thousand feet above the tarmac here at the airport. They're trained right now to go 300 feet before, before pattern altitude and near crosswind turn. That essentially is putting them directly over the town of Superior right now. They're doing their crosswind turn directly over K-8 elementary school and coming back over to more of the neighborhoods. It's maximizing the noise duration and it's maximizing the time the flights are over the town of Superior. Um, and if you also think about, you know, I think one, uh, one resident was here earlier um, left, when you enact a crosswind turn, anytime you're turning the plane, there is an increased opportunity for the plane to stall. That's too low an altitude for, an, for a pilot to be able to regain control of the aircraft and try to salvage the situation. So what I'm gonna show you later on is how I think the new improved pattern actually increases flight safety it actually might make this a better <clears throat> learning experience for going forward. Uh, actually, ben. Okay, this is a typical touch and go pattern as we're experiencing right now with the Tower Superior. Um, air traffic control is extending the pattern right now to go beyond the chasm that we're seeing. So we're not really proposing something that air traffic control is not willing to do at the moment. As you can see, the heavily part of the area here, I mean, that's directly over Rock Creek, South Rock Creek. The areas here are past McCaslin. Next slide, please, Ben. So I'm identifying the crosswind turn right now over the southern part of Town of Superior over Rock Creek. Next slide. What I want to do is propose that we take that crosswind turn and we extend it out past the chasm. Right, next one. And while we're doing that, let's take the downwind leg and pull it out so when the pilots are not only turning over open space, they're turning over open space. Now, per the FAA handbook, they recommend flight patterns half a mile to one mile parallel to the runway. All I'm asking with this is that the pilots continue from the crosswind to the downwind one mile off the parallel leg of the runway, and that actually puts them out into open space. Excellent, guys. So this is the proposition um, as it stands now. Like I said before, pilots are hitting where the red X is. They enter the airspace from the superior. At 6,200 feet, the ground elevation right there is 5544, so they're roughly 650 feet above the ground. If the pilots can continue to climb in elevation, they'll be able to get to the turn of the crosswind as is proposed uh, by open space at um, 6,500 feet, 300 feet higher from where we're here, and they're now close to nine, 954, they're close to 1,000 feet above ground. Keeping in mind what this does for noise signature is that for every 100 feet a plane is higher in the air, it reduces the decibel by six. So, and I'm just going to be bad at math, so just forgive me. If we're 60 here, by the time they get there, that's 300 feet, that's an 18 decibel difference. It is going to be a significant difference at the crosswind turn. And the crosswind turn is one of the noisiest parts of the pattern. So, if we're to take that crosswind turn and now we move it over to open space, and now we're close to that 1,000 feet, and all pilots know that if you're going into a turn and you get a stall, you can pull out at a thousand feet. Lower elevations is very, very difficult to do so. So we're putting it out over open space, which is safer. We're continuing to climb at altitude. Now we're at 6,600 feet. They're beginning the downwind leg at 6,700 feet in altitude, and they're continuing out over open space. And as I said, we're pulling this out one mile parallel to the runway. As we start crossing Broomfield, the Devon York constituency and Westminster, David yours, we're going to be much higher above the ground. So we could be directly in the middle of this pattern here, and that's kind of the, uh, the FedEx building. We could be looking at 1,100 feet above the ground. And if you take the elevation they're at right now and you multiply that distance by six, you could be looking at 
24, 30 decibel difference from where you're getting right now over the town of Westminster. So this pattern, what it looks to do is possibly alleviate the noise from the town of Superior, but also at the same time, we have to pay attention to Broomfield and Westminster as well, because the noise issues they're getting are significant. And if you can get the pilots higher up in the air during the pattern, it's going to significantly reduce the noise. Um, <laughs> Like I said, also to increase the safety, pushing that out to open space is a much better area than having to turn at a lower altitude over the town. And um, next slide, please. Access to the training areas. This is where this guy takes off. This is what we're kind of seeing right now. Pilots are taking off. They're going either Boulder County, they're going to Lewis Hills, they're going to Lafayette, and they're not able to get to sufficient altitude to reduce the noise signature. I hear complaints from residents that they're 500 feet above the house, 600 feet above the house when we get to your space. That's allowed, right? That's allowed. It's too low. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm proposing is if the pilots, and I, I have talked to a number of pilots and a number of flight schools about this, and while they, you know, not crazy about it, they're thinking this could work and this is something they'd be willing to give a shot. So you take off on the upwind leg, you turn over open space, and you continue to gain elevation as you're going through the pattern. Your radio to air traffic control on your base leg that you'd like to take a northern heading to the training areas. And now you're 5,400 ground elevation at the middle of the turn. You're at 6,700 altitude. You're already above 1,000 feet. And now as you continue to go over Louisville right here at this level, you're at 6,700 feet in altitude. Ground is 54 beneath you. As you head closer to Boulder County, 6,700 altitude, 5475. You're able to get a much higher separation from the ground. Thus, for every one, like I said, for every 100 feet, we're talking at one, two, three, four, five, six hundred feet difference from what they're experiencing right now. That could be a significant number, as low as 12 decibels, as high as being 30, 36 as they go forward. Um, next slide, please. And there's also an opportunity to utilize this pattern to go to the southern training areas as well. It would allow the pilots to also utilize a crosswind turn outside the town of Superior, gain altitude, continuing gain altitude, and then fly over open space down by Jefferson County. And I realize there is no northern, or excuse me, there is no southern training area yet. This is an opportunity for the CNR to maybe develop an area uh, in discussions with pilots of where we can send the pilots to the southern training areas, but at least it gives them some sense of an access to that in the future. Jason, tell me about Green Knolls. On out. the east side, no, down, 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 down. What changes there? Where you? Anything there? changes there? Yeah, um, actually, if you significant let's back, there. back a couple slides. No, I'm sorry. So Ashley knows what changes are there. Do you want well, Ashley to fix that? Actually, let me answer that. Ashley can correct me. If I'm not like, um, what we're looking at now is if we're at a higher altitude as we're going over the areas in, West, in Westminster here. The pilots are able to throttle back at a higher altitude and reduce the revs of the engine, and they can basically coast down in a pattern that's much, much quieter because they're also higher up. They can start gliding down in the base turn and then coming for the landing, or if they're going to decide to do a touch and go, they'll touch down, and then they'll accelerate, and then they'll take back off again for another light. My house is on Zephyr. What is what's the changes on my house? I'm sorry, my just house. <laughs> my, not really, my house is not really there, okay. but I'm just pretending. So say my house is on Zephyr. What if you're right here? Yeah. Um, you're at higher elevation. We're, we're getting you maybe 100, 200 feet higher than you are right now. And but, okay. let's just say, I'm like, I mean, I'm an architect. I'm good at fractions. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm good at math. But um, if, you're, if you're gaining 200 feet, that's 12 decibel difference in what you're getting right now. So if you're, if you're hearing it at like bad math, so let's say you hit so it you're at 72. Higher. What you say, you're at, at a higher you're altitude. You're at a higher altitude, so it's going to be quieter. So if you're at 72 okay. decibels, it'll be 60 decibels. Let me just be clear. I'm asking for someone here in the audience. That's not where my house is. <laughs> you're testing. Okay. But Jason, if you move, you're, you've moved the whole operation wider in this picture, correct? Correct. Like you're farther to the south, so you're farther into the neighborhood. So, like, where fewer residents were impacted in that Green Knolls area. This is not mine. I'm trying. I try not to weigh in in your areas, but you asked. So this moves the pattern further into the neighborhood. Yeah. So more residents are impacted in the Green Knolls neighborhood by this pattern. At a higher altitude, but the FAA does allow one mile to be out from that, so that's within FAA regulations. Yes. So yeah. I'm just answering the question she asked. How does this affect Green Knolls? More people are affected. 
Can we finish the presentation before okay, we have sorry, more questions? Sorry, sorry. No, it's all right. Yeah, okay. Um, this, uh, I know there's some so people the that are wondering. Then you, have, you had one other thing with Stephanie? Yeah, I have the, um, the, the uh, supplemental information regarding the planes, if you want to click on that. Um, hold it here for a second, and I'll talk about this. There's been a lot of talk with this pattern. Just because right. with lengthening the pattern, a lot of people are really concerned about the number of planes being put in there, right? We're seeing a lot of planes up in the air right now. So I thought maybe to, to just try to figure this out, I'll take, a, I'll take a concern from a couple of residents and I'll study the problem and I'll pick every single plane out and try to figure out exactly what the planes are doing in the air, how many are in the air, and what we can look at going forward. So then if you look at the first one. So this was a map that was sent to us and it was actually sent to the board as well. Uh, the individual sent, link, sent this in, said that there were 15 planes in the pattern of this house. Oh, yeah. And there are a lot of planes up in the air right now. But for the sake of this argument, we're talking about the pattern for the touch and go, I went through and I separated every single plane out from its pattern on its own fly time for the exact number of um, touch and goes it did and figured out its flight path. And I also interpreted based on the fact that what other planes are going to do, for example, if a plane's at a flight pattern and a jet is coming in, how does that affect that pattern? Does he have to move? Does he have to hold the pattern? Does he have to cross one early, cross one late? It's essentially taking up, um, pushing the majority of planes out towards open space. And what I found about this pattern the complaint was 15 are in the pattern. Okay, next slide, please. I found eight planes in the pattern. Eight planes at this one time flying in the pattern. And the number I'm hearing, I'm studying this, guys. I'm tearing these things apart to try to figure out where we go from this and where we're seeing. I'm always hearing from people eight planes. How many planes do we have? They'd like to see eight planes. They'd like to max it at eight planes. And is eight enough? Is eight too much? Is eight the right number? Air traffic control will not give me an exact number on this because air traffic control has to make that determination of how many planes are in the air. They ultimately rule the skies. During the day, air traffic control and the tower is open from 6 a.m. until 10 o'clock. They make the determination of what goes on. So with this one, and this took double vetting it, talking to a professional that has had experience with air traffic control, um, found the same number I did. This is taking... I mean, this is a good part of the day just to do this one pattern for a few hours of flight time in the air. It was determined that they were eight. Right, next one, please. Same one with this one. This was a general, an individual on social media posted 12 planes in the pattern. I thought, well, let me take a stab with this one too. It's 12, it's less than 15. Maybe it'll take me less time. It took me pretty much the same amount of time to do it. But what you can find out is which planes are utilizing the pattern, which planes aren't in the pattern, which planes are utilizing takeoffs and landings in a different area, which planes are the appropriate planes in there, which are turbo props. You can see like this one over here, that's definitely not going to land here. There's, you know, it's a big 747, they're probably heading to Vegas or whatever. It's more environments than they anyway, but uh, I'm seeing it so far. So, you know, what I'd like to do is just as far as an information gathering, this isn't enough data, right? Two, two maps on this saying we've only got eight, we'll only have eight, are we going to have eight? There's a lot more study on something like this that is going to be done going forward. I'd like to think, hey, if we're eight, that's a good number, right? We're not going to see numbers go up. We can maybe talk about the pattern being longer, and we're still going to see eight, which is going to significantly reduce the, the, the noise signature because the planes will be distant farther apart. But I don't know right now. There's still a big question mark with this. More study has to go into it. Um, and I'm just using the reality of this right now because you know, what do we do as a CNR? We get we get a lot of criticism from the CNR. I, maybe some of it rightly so, right? But we're doing everything we can. You know, I, I live in this area. I'm, I'm a latecomer. I moved to Superior in 2017. I'm from New York. I spent part of my childhood in New York, New York and Ireland. You know, I'm putting my roots down here. You know, I, this is where I want to live, you know. But yeah, I want it to be a quiet community just like you do. I want the people to have less noise. It doesn't go over your house. I'm, and this is against so our board. I'm doing everything I can. I'm trying, everything you said that so they so think we do. I'm doing I'm not doing anything any different than air traffic control is doing right now. Air traffic control is extending the pattern. I'm utilizing that extension of the pattern. There's got to be some way forward with this. So if we can learn from this opportunity of what we can do down the road. I'd like to see the CNR not be a body that just waits for consultants to come in and dictate what we can do. Why don't we present ideas? Why don't we create opportunities where we can solve this problem together? Because there's eight of us, there's eight very smart individuals on this table. Opportunities we can talk about going forward. I think we can try to get somewhere with the noise issue if we all put our heads together and we work towards it. So that's pretty much the presentation.
Thank you, Jason, for your presentation. Uh, Roundtable members, uh, I, I, I think the intent is not to vote on this, um, but to kind of figure out uh, what what do we what else do we desire with this? What would we like to see with this? Um, or not at all. I want to make just a couple general general comments, a couple broad general, and then maybe a little bit more specific to kind of some of this stuff. But I think the broad general comment that CNR doesn't do anything, I completely disagree with. I, I think that expectations are difficult here because there's a variety of expectations. Some people's expectations are that this group is going to dictate what happens to every aircraft in the air and you're going to move it where I want you to move it. And that's clearly not the case. Um, I don't, so I, I, I disagree with that. And I, but I do agree that we should be looking at things like this. I think we need to have every option on the table. But the specifics of, of this, I don't know if this is the right answer or not. Um, but I think I think that you know engaging in engaging a conversation in it, I think um, to me would be an appropriate thing to do for the CNR to do. I see a couple of issues, and and I you know I may be the only one on the roundtable here who's who's flown an airplane in and out of this aircraft or in and out of this airport. So there's a couple of things that would be somewhat unconventional about it, both from a pilot's perspective. Um, you know, I think air traffic control is in control of these things within this airspace. So it's not a, uh, you know, as a pilot, you, you follow an air traffic control. So I think what they have to say is probably more important than what pilots have to say, but I think pilots need to weigh in on some perspective like this. Taking off the pilot thing though, and talking about from a, a, a elected official or, or community noise roundtable member. Um, I think there's some positive things about it, but there's some negative things about it. Here's here's a couple of them. So positive, I think, you know, the, the attempts to get low aircraft and low turns off of off of the top of neighborhoods is a really good idea. Um, you know, if it goes from one person's house to another person's house, there's going to be friction there, obviously. But but I think I think that's a good idea and a good goal. Um, one of the disadvantages of something like this is if this becomes, you know, the takeoff, fly the pattern, and then exit the pattern from the opposite side, is that you concentrate all the exiting traffic over somewhere where there's not exiting traffic now. Um, and so I think that's a little bit difficult from our, our standpoint of not wanting to, uh, to concentrate traffic. I do understand the part about the aircraft potentially be higher and put maybe even a lower power setting and 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 that the noise by their aircraft might be less. But I think those are all things worth um, investigating. I would say a set expectations with something like this is none of these are silver bullets. You know, there's two runways and two patterns in operation at the same time. And, you know, the the um, this fix fixes kind of one of the four quadrants or maybe makes an improvement to one of the four quadrants in a normal operation of this airport between a pilot on the, or excuse me, between a pattern on the north runway and a pattern on the south runway. And so I think it's worth talking about, it's worth looking at, but for everybody's expectations, this isn't a solution to noise for at, at all. But again, I think that we had talked about it earlier, our best approach, I think one of our, our, our public mentioned it in their comment. Our best approach is, you know, small increments wherever we can get them are worth pursuing. Because I think after a couple of years of looking at this, it defies any simple answer that fixes the problem for everybody. So so my thought on it, my rambling thought here on it would be that I think it's worth it for us to have further discussions about this. And I would encourage us as the round table to engage with the, the users, the pilots who would who would be flying this, I would encourage us to engage with air traffic controllers or experts in air traffic control who who could point out from their perspective what the things are and have further conversations um, about not only this but 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 other ideas similar that, that could potentially make some incremental improvements for some people, if not if, if not. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, Miss? Thank you. Oh, so, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. I, I was going to turn to you first. You then, to okay, back. great. I'll go to you first. <laughs> um, so after consultation with staff, one of my concerns is apparently um, the distance of the 
uh, I'm going to say the circle is the same at um, is consistent airport to airport to airport. Yeah. So that pilots don't have to think, oh, I'm at Rocky Mountain and here, you know, we go this much further. Um, and that's what that's the safety piece is that um, what happens in aviation is consistency in whatever you do. So pilots don't have to worry about that. So that's probably my biggest concern. There's some questions I have that are not mine uniquely. I listened to the Superior meeting. I was also at the Westminster meeting. Um, so some, some information to find out. One, can it be a 90-day try? Is it if we would send this to the tower to look at and to adopt, is it a forever deal? Um, so that's a question to ask. The other question, I, I think you did a good job. I think you did a unique job of mapping out. It's not 15 planes, it's eight. But I think we need to ask the question directly. If the circle is bigger, will you put more planes in there? Because that's the concern yeah. that we've heard of Superior. That's the concerns we heard um, at Westminster. Let's just ask it directly. Uh, I'm in the same place that you are. I mean, I, I think people, while well, people say they want a silver bullet, bullet I think we've got to find ways that make it a, a little bit better. And if this will make it a little bit better, and if air traffic control says that it's manageable, I, I think you do it. I think you, you help, even if it, it's even if it's just two or three houses or two or three hours. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would love it if we could test it, right? See if it's going to work for air traffic control. Ultimately, it's going to make the determination. And I, I've had some of the flights go say, well, can we try this during the day? But understanding it's not going to be sustainable for everybody. We're not going to be able to do a 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. when they only do this pattern because air traffic control is not going to do that. I mean, those, those are fantastic questions. We know to pose. It's, you know, it's a learning process right now. There's certainly merits to it, certain things that have to be studied, the number of planes in the pattern, air traffic control probably can tell right away exactly what's going on. You know, this will be online. If you want to, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it'll be there. Okay. Um, okay. They'll be able to figure out, you know, clearly with luck, they can probably tell exactly what's going on. It takes me eight hours, 10 hours, and then having to get ready. Um, air traffic control's input would be great. FAA's input would be great. But like I said, as far as just a learning tool right now, something to be able to just Answer more questions than not. I mean, let's utilize any opportunity to ask ourselves questions for this. Because I want to try anything. Anything that we can do to alleviate the storage issue is going to be a good thing. Whether it works or doesn't, it might fall right, fall right off. But you know, let's come up with every opportunity we can and bring it to the table and talk about it. Because the eight strong, smart people here talk about good and bad about plans. We can get through a lot more things than we can. Certainly a lot more than I can on my own. And the whole point of me wanting to present this tonight is. I just one person coming up with this, working on this, trying to figure it out. I want input. I want you guys talking to me. I want community input on this. I want more people to understand what we're trying to do as a CNR, which is really ultimately just try to reduce the noise issues we're having. Sir. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Sultan. I want to thank Trustee Serbu. I really think you're trying very hard to look for solutions and like be solutions oriented and creative and collaborative. And I think that is laudable. I appreciate it very, very much. So I just I think about things to conclusions and like different pathways. And so on this one, when, when thinking about it, uh, so if we were to vote no against this, does this mean that this pattern wouldn't be flown? No. They fly this pattern now and air traffic control can do this pattern whenever they want. If we voted yes, that we want this pattern, does this mean that that would be the pattern that they would fly? No. Air traffic control controls the space. They could do this pattern if they wanted when they have more flights in the route and they wouldn't have to when they don't. So from my perspective, this is a futile exercise for this group to weigh in on it because it gives people the sense that we have control over this and we do not. Any other questions, comments? Yes. A um, couple things. One, I appreciate all your effort. Since I've been back on this, we reached out multiple times to go through different uh, solutions and figure out how it's going to affect your community, how I feel it's going to affect my community, and it worked collaboratively. And I think, again, like I mentioned earlier, I think that's what a community noise roundtable does, and that's why we have representatives for all these different communities. Um, 
I will say that Westminster had a lengthy discussion about it, and you heard the concerns that they had. One of the concerns was uh, whether or not it was a forever thing or if it was something to try. I will tell you, if we had a vote tonight, my board did give direction four to three to support this as long as it wasn't permanent, if it did negative impact on, on it. And they had all the questions, you know, that they wanted answered. But I think that the majority of my council wants solution, even if they're incremental, like we've heard tonight. And I think, you know, so I hope we continue to work on this stuff because that certainly is the direction of the, the representation for the community of Westminster. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I also want to thank Jason. I think this is a wonderful idea and it, it's like a first step. Let's just take a few steps and this would be a good step to try. If it works, wonderful. If it doesn't work, well, it's not going to make it worse. Um, I'm wondering if there's any way that we can contact the, the flight schools, the pilots in particular, but the owners also, and get their ideas on how they think they could improve the flights or timing, whatever they can do, and get the flight school and the pilots on board to make the situation better for everybody. Yeah, and I think, uh, just to provide some history, so uh, before the CNR was established, that was something that the flight schools and the airport director came up with was uh, a number of voluntary noise reduction measures. Mm -hmm. um, those are posted on the gates uh, into, I believe, into the airport or next to the flight schools. Uh, you can see those. Uh, when we did a tour, uh, we saw all of those flight uh, uh, noise reduction flight procedures that were there. Those are all voluntary. So that doesn't mean that they have to follow those. None of those are mandatory. Um, some, I, I would imagine, I, correct me if I'm wrong, some pilots are going to follow those and some aren't. The ATC is going to follow those sometimes and sometimes not. It, safety is the highest priority. So it, it, at, at that point, and then efficiency is next. Uh, and then noise reduction is further down the list. So safety, efficiency are the top two uh, pieces. Yes, Scott. Uh, I, I would disagree with you just slightly. I think, okay. I think every every pilot here, um, except for pilots transitioning in here who've never been here before, or whatever, don't know about the procedures. I think every pilot attempts to follow it. However, issues, so issues, you, but... you have lots of things to do as a pilot, and the most important thing you have to do is not crash. Yes. And so you, that's where your effort is, and, and it's, a, it's a complex, difficult uh, environment that you operate in between operating an aircraft and being responsible for the all the weather, and then you've got traffic around, and you've got air traffic control to, to communicate with and follow the uh, the instructions that they give you and do um, and do noise abatement procedures. And, and I believe that the, the voluntary procedures are followed to a very high level. It's just my experience around here. They're taught, you know, so the students learn right from the get go, um, and they're followed to a very high level. But the world is a you know, the environment is an ever-changing environment, and when the wind changes directions, the patterns have to change directions, and things get busy, and, and different things happen than, than, than happens every time. And so, um, is every aircraft following it to the T? Of course not, but it's not because they're not trying to. Right. Nor is it just so far down their priority list they can't get to it. I just don't want it to be thought of as that. I think it's a standard procedure that every pilot follows after not crashing and following instructions. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't want to team that, yeah. that I, I hope it didn't come across that way, that they're disregarding. I don't believe the pilots are disregarding these. Uh, but to your point, sometimes you're able to follow these in addition to everything else, and sometimes you're not because all of those other things. Yeah, and, and that's the same for every noise procedure at every airport, including Bolton County Airport and every other airport. That... Not the county's airport. Oh, okay. Boulder City's airport, the city of Boulder. You're not. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other question, uh, questions, comments uh, on this subject? Uh, as as we stated, uh, we are not going to vote on this tonight. Uh, the uh, town of Superior has uh, signaled that they are not in support of, of this, uh, and so we are not going to put a uh, vote to this tonight. Uh, but this was the uh, Coleman. We had asked for further information. Thank you, uh, trustee for uh, and member uh, for uh, bringing forward the additional information on this and all of your work uh, on this topic. Um, uh, no, if I can add really quickly, yes. 
not actually done asking your comment bluff, but had this gone to a vote, I would vote now on it due to the, you know my respect for my board being um, not favor with it. But like I said, there's still so many things with this from the variables that we study needs to look at. Um, you know, maybe maybe you can you know, there's probably for another time, right? But right now it's just uh, it's just not there. And I, and I think that that's a, that, that point, uh, I think that we can put a, a bow on this. Uh, this would be another one of those issues where we need 100% uh, uh, consensus on uh, because it is shifting noise over different communities in a different way. And so we would need 100% consensus on this. And because we do not have the vote of Superior, uh, it, it, Peter, I, I think that Jason is, is choosing not to uh, put forward a motion. We do not see any other motions being put forward at this point. We have the information that it is. Uh, so thank you uh, again. Um, the last uh, piece of our agenda is the committee and board member reports. Uh, at this point, we do not have any committee, so it is really board member reports. Uh, I would like to make sure that we tee up the conversation uh, that was started uh, prior uh, to in, in, the, in the meeting. Uh, so at this point, uh, members, uh, we are kind of at a new part at a decision point. Um, uh, March is typically our month in which we discuss the work plan. Uh, we are not doing that because I felt that this was going to be happening. This was a much bigger conversation of what do we do now? Um, we have our consultant contract that at this point we are choosing not to renew or to not uh, negotiate a due contract. Um, myself and Commissioner Kraft Tharp, we had a meeting uh, with uh, the FAA. We talked about the structure of the, the CNR. We talked about what are the possibilities are there to impact uh, the noise. Um, and uh, really, we have the CNR pathway. We have a pathway to continue uh, dialogue with our congressional representatives to ensure that uh, changes are made at that level. This is a federal issue. This isn't a local issue. Um, we, uh, we've talked a lot about trust, right, and rebuilding that trust. We had an airport director that uh, was uh, stated as undermining the work of the, uh, of the CNR. Um, quoted as wasting time and wasting resources of the local governments, right? So that trust has to be built up not only with the member jurisdictions in the airport, but also amongst our members as well. Um, we have, we, uh, you know, potentially have a, a point in time to either restart or pause our CNR at this point. Uh, we just went through a lengthy process with our VFR routes, and ultimately we are not continuing with that. Um, and so what, is that, what does that mean? What is that pathway for us? Um, and, uh, you know, one more piece to, to, to put out there, uh, John Bauer, um, he has been asked to uh, do some other special projects, so he will not, he will not be attending our meetings, uh, most likely as frequently, but potentially uh, not in the foreseeable future because he is dealing with these special projects as opposed to uh, our CNR meetings. It's just for the new members of the FAA rep that had been attending. Thank you. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the question that was asked earlier is how do we continue the conversations on this? And that's not just particular topics, but really the CNR in general. How do we continue forward? Do we continue forward? I would ask that we don't make that decision tonight. But I do believe that if we want to have conversation tonight, that we do. Uh, but I believe that we all need to go back to our uh, jurisdictions and have that conversation with our jurisdictions to say, how would we like to continue to participate? Do we continue to participate? Is this the right forum? So is that a proposal for our future agenda topic? Like in the next month agenda, we would talk about should the, each person would go back and find out if they want to continue with a community voice roundtable or if we would discontinue it at this time. I, I would suggest that we put this as an agenda item, uh, whether or not we as a roundtable and the individual members continue our support and involvement in the CNR, or if we would like to, as a group, as a body, to um, to dissolve the CNR, or if there are certain members that would like to not continue uh, in the CNR. So I think that yes, I would suggest that we put that on a future agenda to make a to make a vote on and and to actually publicly notice this. But I think as we've gone through the meeting, I think it's important that we at least uh, potentially tee up that conversation. Yes. What happens if, if the body dissolves? What happens with the? Thank you for asking that. That's. I, I was under the understanding. We have a decision on it, Tuesday. It, it goes away. So oh, thank you. Lots of airports do cart 150s without my traffic. 
So I'll, so I'll answer. So we asked that uh, the last time, and Part 150 study continues to move forward, uh, regardless of whether the CNR is in place or not. We have two members that have been assigned to the selection committee. Uh, Commissioner, right? Hill you know, and I. It's, there are two members. I'm one of them. Maybe so, Jason. Uh, and Jason maybe the other one. Um, so we have two members that are that have been assigned uh, to the selection committee for that Part 150 study to to get the consultant. But regardless of whether the CNR is in place or not, that Part 150 study continues for. Haven't I mean, they been assuming they vote for it? I mean, well, so it's on the agenda. Jason and this is new. This is new information <laughs> that I think that the board needs to be aware of. I'm not sure. Well, because my, you know, my, why, my why concern. You <laughs> well, here's my concern. This is the, the avenue for our communities to participate, right. to give feedback, and to issue with noise. And the part 150 is my understanding. And that's something our community should ask for for a long time. So I hope that as we go back to our community, that we we keep that in front of my very well. So maybe the agenda is agenda to say like part 150 plan going forward and would is does that necessitate this board or not? I think that's an important part of the discussion at the next agenda, right? I think the other thing that I would like to propose that needs to be part of the conversation is we've heard from people that they may that they file a complaint and they don't hear anything back. Where this is people's well, people are saying that they want decision making and they want more, they're going to get less. Where is the avenue to be able to express your concerns? Number one, where is the avenue for impacted communities to have a seat at the table? Sure. I know you, it's not all the decisions that you want, Ashley. No, no, no. But I'm really curious. But this about is a place for impacted communities to be here. If you demand the airport to be more responsive to community members, you should tell the airport director to be more responsive to community members. That's really That's totally fine. separate. Councilor Dumont. So on that note, that was my one I asked about because we've heard about things from the community. So and obviously you're the interim and I'd like to figure out how we make sure that there is follow-up, especially when members of the community bring things forward just so that the body says, you know, and, and and I'm not saying that it did or did not happen, but when things like that happen in my community and somebody comes and says, hey, this didn't get followed up, that's certainly something I wanted at least just see record of the follow up of what it was. Um, and then we did hear, and I've heard multiple times about the flight path with the jets over green holes. And uh, if, if truly that's getting ping pong back and forth between the airport and the FAA, if we could chase that down, because I know that from my end, I've heard that from my constituents, and I would like an answer to know if that really is truly in ping pong, because I don't think that's acceptable if it is. We should figure out who's in yeah. charge, what the answer is, even if it's, you know, there's not a solution. I'd like to, to know that. Um, but as far as like a report, or I think that I do need to go back to my community. Um, but I did also want to share, um, and I hope that members of the public, as well as members of the CNR, took the opportunity to listen to our council meeting on Monday. It was a study session because CDPHE did do a very thorough job of reporting on lead and lead specifically from airports and aviation. And so I think it was a worthwhile presentation. If you haven't had an opportunity to listen to it, I would invite you to do so. Our meetings are published on our YouTube. You can go to cdrminister.us and find that. Uh, and so, if, if they happen to be listening to this, because they don't have anything better to do, thank, I thank them for uh, joining us because it was a very good presentation. And it's something that you know the community is obviously concerned about. And that crosses over into this block. I know that it separates that noise, um, but you know it's it's an important topic that the community needs to address. So. And, and thank you, and, and the Westminster City Council for hosting that conversation. Very well. Uh, any other board member reports or comments on this discussion? But it sounds like that we all have some conversations to do with our own jurisdictions, and uh, and it sounds like that we will be bringing this back for an official agenda item at our next meeting. Any other board uh, board member reports at this point? Yes. Yeah, we got uh, one. Um, I met with uh, ADK, who's doing the search for the new airport director last Tuesday, and. Um, 
You know, I, 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 I said them what's most important to me and my constituents, what I think is going to be most important to every member uh, who sits at the front table. Yeah, he's got to be, he or she's got to be financially with it. He's, um, this director has to understand aircraft flight. I understand uh, having a license is part of the, the requirement. But, you know, what I said, I'd really like to see as the first and foremost priority of this new director is community outreach. I want to see the new director reach out initially to get ahead of things on his or her own initiative, not as a response to something, not as a reaction to something. I want to see the new director be a partner with the communities. It's very important, and I think it's very important with a lot of people that they want the individual to be accessible, to be able to answer questions, to be there. If something comes up that the director, for whatever change, however small, it's it's put out to the public. People are made aware of things. Um, and when I saw the packet come out, everybody got a copy of that, of, of the proposal. That was one of the leading items was community focus. And I think that's really, really important going forward. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and in addition, I've been, you know, thinking about other things that we can do to try to mitigate the noise. And one of the things I kind of went back to on my own is, you know, we have a fly quiet program at the airport that doesn't necessarily fly quiet. But um, I, you know, I, I had reached out to Jefferson County and I asked them, is there any chance that I can get with the flight schools and sit down with them and say, what is it about the current fly quiet program that doesn't work for you? What is it that you would like to see changed that you could adopt to in your habits and your patterns that could help noise reduction over the towns? Um, so that's going to be something going on. And, and I, I'd like to involve the CNR with that going forward as well, because I think it would be a really good opportunity for us to bring this back. The previous CNR, I, I, was it a previous CNR? I'm, that created There's that? only been one. This one? <laughs> well, no, the, the, oh, the, the, no, no, the, yeah, the, the noise abatement stuff was a task force. Task force. Okay, yeah. The airport task force and consult consisted of a variety of constituencies in, in and around. Good. Yeah, John, thank you for the for clarification on that. So I really like that as an opportunity for the CNR. So, you know, things when we talk about going forward as the CNR, there's other opportunities that we can try to think together and maybe with the flight schools and maybe with a new fly quiet program that we could talk about. Um, and I think that would be really important to, to, you know, the members of all the constituencies because they just want to feel heard. They want to feel being part of the process. So anything we do going forward, you know, I, I'd like to give it a shot. So that's uh, pretty much all I have for board report. Thank you. Great. Any other questions, comments, or I should say board report. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So just really quickly, is what you're referencing the there was a report done or a study done with recommendations right a few years ago by talking about the noise abatement maybe it, it was what the group a, B, C. Oh, no 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 abc times two that was a consultant group that the town of superior and louisville, city of louisville, city of louisville engaged to um to do a report on on airport noise impacts. Yeah. They gave us all the same recommendations. We just hired HMMH to get up again. I was going to say that you know, in doing sort of looking back, trying to prepare for these meetings, that seems like recommendations that made sense to me. And so I, I would just say I would hope that we don't lose that word, just like we maybe that was what was incorporated. The task force incorporated a lot okay. of those ideas, but not all into the flight program. Great, great. And the only thing I would ask too is in the kind of conversation once you know hopefully we decide to keep this going um i think we need a process conversation because it feels like what just happened with the visual flight routes and what happened with the daytime you know touch and goes it's maybe it's just a process challenge and maybe i just don't understand what a process is but i think we need clarity there so that we don't run into these roadblocks where we're trying things and we go too far and then we waste time I don't know that it's processed more than what John brings up each time is like what is actually um, sphere of influence or sphere of control versus just people want to talk about something. It's this yeah. expectation thing. Yeah. And I think if I think we should have frank conversations next time and draw logical conclusions about where we might go. All right. Yes. So in this conversation that we're having next month, I would also encourage people go back to the centennial February and March meeting notes in which they talk about they have a subcommittee um, of a study, a study room, study, study what? Study group. Study group. Thank you. I lost that for a minute. Um, and when we met with the FAA, that's the, the concept that they would like, is that the FAA would be able to meet with the schools and CNR members. And so I think if you look at the centennial 
um, minutes um, and it gives you a really good idea of what they're able to do, what outcomes they have, um, right? And, and that goes back to the concept you were talking about is, shouldn't we be having conversations with the school? Exactly. Yes. And having conversations up front about different ideas. Yeah. And thank you for that. And we, we've discussed this before. That was that was just a suggestion that came up. Uh, we we at this point with our IGA, we all of our subcommittees have to be open to the public. Um, so a study group um, would be very challenging for uh, our CNR to adapt to our current IGA. Thank you for bringing it up again. All right. Any other board member reports? All right. Seeing none. Uh, tonight's uh, RMMA CNR meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Rocket members. Do you want me to answer questions? Please leave the number.